Hi everyone and welcome to a special edition of Langer at the Mic where I have a special guest interview for you today. He is a former All-Star and Major League left-handed pitcher. He won 119 games in 14 seasons between 1969 and 1982 with the Boston Red Sox and Montreal Expos and he is the third winningest lefty in Red Sox history. He is now 74 years old, but at 67 years old, he became the oldest pitcher to ever win a professional baseball game. He is Bill Lee. So here it is. Enjoy my interview with the Spaceman. We're joined by former MLB All-Star left-handed pitcher, Mr. Bill Lee. How are you doing on this fine Sunday afternoon? I'm doing great. You know, I had a great day yesterday. I coached the high school team uh, early in the morning. I golfed with a 90-year-old and shot my age, and then I had a great dinner. I threw batting practice to my own team. I had a complete day, and I came home and I woke up, so that's good. <laughs> thank Yeah, thank God. I mean, first thing, let me ask you, uh, whose uh, high school uh, baseball team was it? It's Burlington High School. I coached their summer program, and we won the summer program, and we have 11 hardy guys, and they all do multitasking. And uh, they came back yesterday. They won 4-3, to three, and my uh, best friend's son came in with the bases loaded, nobody out in the ninth inning, threw one pitch, got a triple play, and they won. Doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> Doesn't get any more clutch than that, indeed. Um, but uh, but yeah, and then also you said you're you were practicing with your former team. How often do you practice with them? We we had our first practice. We had a new group of guys. We had twelve people show up at Callahan Park. I threw uh, about thirty minutes of batting practice. I hit a little bit, and then I went and had uh, supper in Winooski at a friend of mine's restaurant uh, called the Waterworks on the uh, on the Winooski. Uh, actually, it's what's the name of that river that runs through there? Yeah, the Winooski River. And it comes by the old mills. It's a beautiful place where a lot of Canadians went, but now they don't because of the COVID. <laughs> yeah, of course. Actually, that's, that's right near Burlington, right? It's like a couple of miles north of Burlington? Yeah, it is. It's the town you hit coming down the hill uh, by the airport uh, before you get to Burlington proper. It's an old mill town. Uh, it's, it's a P Polish family, but it's uh, a great working class neighborhood and a uh, very good restaurant. I recommend it highly. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I've had, I had a great day. I had a great morning. Uh, I've had a great winter. I've written two books. I've written the Spaceman Chronicles, which is on Amazon. You can get it. And I've also got a second one called the uh, Last, the Odyssey of the of the Sweet Last Sweet Ride, about me on my voyages in a '98 Buick, my dad's old car, which has uh, got 300,000 miles on it, and that's coming out soon. Also, and you know, I've just been very prolific in this uh, days of COVID. I'm very happy about it. Yeah, thank God. And honestly, that's so important nowadays. Uh, obviously, in, in the States there, it hasn't been hit as much as we have been. Canada and particularly in areas like Vermont are not as affected as, as uh, New York City or Toronto or Montreal, I can imagine. But I want to go back to that baseball practice when you're throwing uh, batting practice, right? Um, were you throwing batting practice like for the hitters to practice or were you actually trying to, you know, throw your, throw your junk and try to get them out? No. No, I, uh, you're only as good as your team can hit, and I make them look as good as possible because hitting is the hardest thing to do. You know, it's a round ball, a round bat, and you got to hit it squarely, and it's the hardest thing, Ted Williams said, in all of sports. So you've got to build their confidence up. And, you know, there's some of them you just can't build their confidence up because they couldn't hit water if they fell out of a boat. But I go out and I, I, I throw – all cross seamers, let them hit, strengthen my arm. Once they get on that, then I'll throw them a couple of two seamers, see how they react if they go the other way, and build their confidence up. I don't throw any breaking stuff early, and my spring training rituals have always been the same. The key is I get a callus on my index finger and a callus on my thumb. When those two calluses are mature, you can turn on the lights and start the season which uh, I've been throwing for about a month now. 
I was throwing in the snow with a bunch of softballs at Craftsbury in my town. I have a bucket of about 60 softballs, and I throw them against the screen to strengthen my arm. And, uh, yeah, I've been uh, preparing for this day, hopefully. And uh, I think we spring came yesterday after that brief snow squall we had for 40 hours. But I think it's over, and uh, I'm ready to go. So you've been playing baseball pretty much your entire life for 74 years, right? You you said it best early on in our conversation. You said, uh, you know, you're amazed that I'm still playing and stuff. I, I, it refers back to Mark Twain. He said it. He said the two greatest days in your life are the day you're born and the day you find out the reason why. And I have the shortest period between them of all. I was born on a Saturday, and on Sunday I was at a ballpark. So I knew the reason why when I was one day old. My aunt played, my grandfather played pro ball, my dad played, I played, my sons play, and I have my younger son as the number one softball coach in North America. So that is the reason for my existence. Yeah, so your grandfather was uh, William and your aunt Annabelle, right? Yeah, Annabelle, yeah, and my dad was a William, and I'm a William, and my son's a Michael, because my uh, first wife decided to have it that way. <laughs> uh, hey, that's a great name. That's my name, so uh, so that's an excellent name, but I want to ask you, how does how did having base, how did having family, or how did having lineage in baseball, family lineage in baseball with your grandfather, with your aunt, how did that allow you to get to that purpose or that short time between the day you were born and the reason why you were born? Easily. <laughs> A one word answer. <laughs> it was easy. And that's why, because I can throw strikes at 74. I could throw strikes when I was six. Uh, I've written in my book, uh, I was put in a crib. I had square objects that said A, B, C, and D. And I had round objects. I threw all the square objects out because they were sharp and they bothered me. And I kept the round objects close at heart. And, uh, you know, I can throw darts. I can play golf. I'm a good tennis player. You know, you, uh, I can play basketball. I could have been a pro probably in basketball if I had been a little quicker. You know, but... Uh, my grandson is a great basketball player. Uh, everything, you know, genetically, it's uh, you have those feelings, and I, I believe I was blessed, you know, with uh, with an ability to to not think. Thinking gets you in trouble. You know, you have two sides of the brain: the left side and the right side. And according to psychology, you have the thinking brain, you know, and you have the feeling brain. The thinking brain believes it's driving the car, but it's wrong. The feeling brain drives the car. And uh, I've been running with that brain my whole life. Now, coming back to the uh, toy blocks that you threw as a kid, right? And that's, I guess, the first thing that eventually evolved to baseballs. But would you throw those blocks left-handed or right-handed? Everything was left-handed. I am about as predominantly left-handed as you can get. But a left-hander is better off than a right-hander because everything's designed. Scissors, cars, doorknobs, everything's designed for the right-hander. So we were forced to use our right side more, which gave more of us an ambidexterity. And that is why left-handers are the only people in their right minds. I like that. I like the sound of that. left hand people are in their right minds. Um, but what also, uh, one thing I found that was interesting is that you also served, now going from obviously a young age of being just baseball in your family, baseball already part of your life, but then you served in the U.S. Army for uh, during the Vietnam War. And how did that make you become a better professional baseball player? It gives you discipline. You know, it, uh, it it forces you to go to a regiment, so you get up early, you write early, like Hemingway did. Uh, you know, it uh, it you know, you polish your shoes like your father. My father was in the army. My grandfather fought in World War One. Uh, 
you know, it's uh, it's it's it gives you discipline. I believe in mandatory military service like Israel, and I believe that that is the problem why the United States is a lackadaisical, fruitless company uh, country that's uh, destined to uh, die die on the vine. I, I think we need more discipline and uh, you know a little less bondage. <laughs> that's from that's from a Mel Brooks movie. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But uh but another thing in terms of your discipline and your and working on your craft, working on your on your pitching, now you are renowned for all the off speed pitches that you threw, um and the, the, the different off speed pitches that you had. But with that being said, what was the the highest velocity on your fastball at any point in your life? Wow. In Texas, it said I threw 93 miles an hour, but I knew they were lying because it was Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I guess everything's bigger in Texas, as they say, right? Everything's bigger in Texas. Exactly right. Yeah. No, I, I'll tell you what. Hitting is timing. Pitching is upsetting that timing. And the key is, it's like the Russell brothers used to say, Rick and Paul Russell, you know, they said, when the going gets tough, the tough slow it down. And uh, you, you learn how to change speeds. Everybody wants to hit the fastball. In batting practice, you see nothing but fastballs, you know. And in the game, I, I show them the fastball, and I get them out with off speed. And then once I send you a steady diet of off speed, I'll eventually come back and get you out with the fastball. The key is upsetting that timing. So with that being said, with your mission to upset hitters' timings, and you made a career and are still essentially, like you played well into your 60s and even, you can say, 70s now with your with pitching, but with all that being said, what made your off-speed pitches, like especially your, your famous leafist pitch, what made them different compared to other pitchers' off-speed pitches? Two things, gravity and the Coriolis effect. <laughs> that is uh, the circulation of the earth, spin, and the northern and southern hemisphere. The closer I get to the equator, the worse I am. The further away I get from the equator, the better I am. That's why I pitch well in Canada. Yeah, so you can say that you could actually control gravity to some extent? Yes, I can, through yoga breathing and through exhaling and uh, kind of a Zen mind control. I have this ability, and plus I, I'm associated, I'm friends with three witches I know and one warlock. So I, I believe uh, I'm the only guy that ever pitched in the major leagues that danced with Margaret Hamilton, and she was the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course, from uh, Wizard of Oz, right? Yes, yes, yes. You just can't. There, I got pictures. I danced in Orpheus's uh, Euripides's Orpheus of the Underworld, a Sarah Caldwell ballet in Boston with Margaret Hamilton. Excellent. Um, but with that being said, now going uh, looking more at your career in uh, retrospect, because you're with the Red Sox, and of course you're with the Montreal Expos, and you can't see me right now, but I'm wearing my Montreal Expos t-shirt in my uh, office, my virtual studio here at home. Um, but with that being said, before you go on to the Expos, what was your favorite moment with the Boston Red Sox? Wow. I would say... My favorite moments when I beat Jim Palmer and I pitched the longest complete game in the history of Major League Baseball. I threw a 11 inning complete game against Baltimore and it went 10 hours and 23 minutes. Had three rain delays. It started at 2:15 and I think it was over at a quarter to 10. How many pitches was that in that uh, 11 inning complete game? All of them. <laughs> Could have been 140. Just think how many times I had to warm up <laughs> between between rain yeah. delays. I took I took two naps and had a meal. 
<laughs> I mean, you had to if, if, for that long of a game. And also, um, but let me also ask you along those lines, you talk so much about disrupting hitters timing. How can a rain delay or an unexpected or unforeseen circumstance affect your timing and your rhythm as a starting pitcher? Doesn't affect mine at all. I go into a suspended state of animation, you know, and I kind of, I do my yoga breathing. I used to do it in Montreal during rain delays. I would go to sleep under the table during the playoffs, and the children of all the players would be in the family room, and they'd be running over the top of me, and I wouldn't even hear them. I could fall asleep. And the amount of time it takes a jet to go down the runway to lift off, I will throw my seat back, and I will be asleep in four seconds. Honestly, that in itself is talent because I personally – struggle with getting to sleep or at least falling back to sleep so that is i guess with uh with your yoga and your zen and your state of mind your calmness and focus um that is truly a um a uh, really awesome talent to have to really just shut your mind off like that um but now looking also at your time with the expos now obviously my dad lifelong expos fan and anyone watching here on my youtube channel and listening on my spotify podcast here on Langer at the Mic, I have to ask you, I have to do my due diligence and ask you on October 9th, 1982, top of the ninth, Rick Monday hits the go ahead home, sorry, 1981, excuse me, 1981. Rick Monday hits the go ahead home run off Steve Rogers. Now, what would you have done differently if you got to face Rick Monday instead of Steve, instead of uh, Steve Rogers? All I had to do was get in the game. When that ball went out of the park, geese were flying south. And my son Andy said, well, that's it. That's the end of the season. And he was right. You know, you know, we got to come up again, but we did not, we did not hit. And I'll tell you something. I saw it all coming. I saw Rogers warm up. He had nothing. Jim Fanning went to that mound and left him in. And I had warmed up. I had tapped my hat. I was ready to come in. You look at Rick Mundy's record against me, you have the ability to look that up. Rick Mundy would never have hit me out of the ballpark unless I hung a breaking ball, and I don't think I would have. I would have thrown him sinkers down and in, dropped down sliders low and away. We would have got him out, and we would have won the ball game in the bottom of the ninth inning, and uh, it, we would have got on and got to play the New York Yankees, of which I'm the number four all-time winning percentage, so... I never got that opportunity. I could have won the World Series for the Montreal Expos that year, I am sure. But what you did have the opportunity to do is, like you said, just keep playing ball into your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, even to some extent in your 70s. Now, I will bring this up. In 2010, in against the uh, or with the Brockton Sox of the Canadian American Baseball Association, you had a game where you pitched five and a third innings. You gave up five hits, two earned runs, and one strikeout at the age of 63 years old, becoming the oldest person, the oldest pitcher to pitch and win in a minor league baseball game. It was a 7-3 win, I believe, over the uh, Worcester Tornadoes. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions of that. Of course, how did you get that uh, that that one strikeout? Probably luck. <laughs> you know, I didn't throw hard back then. That was <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> you know, I I never struck people out. I, I believed in pitching to contact. But did you say fifty three? I was sixty three years of age. Yeah, sixty three. I, I believe I said sixty three. If not, then yes, yeah, sixty three years old, indeed. Hearing's the second thing to go out of a 74-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, hey, and I pitched a nine-inning complete game two years later for the San Rafael Pacifics, and I pitched against a pitcher that pitched for the California Angels. Uh, he was pitching for the Maui team, and uh, I went nine there, got an RBI and a single, and then I got traded to – where did I get traded to? To Sonoma, Stompers. And I pitched another stoppers. five and two-thirds innings. You know, I, I won a pro game when I was 61, 63, 65, and 67. And people say, how did you do that? I said, because I, I, I pitch well in odd years, not in even-numbered years. <laughs> Fair, fair enough. But I want to back up a second. Uh, there was a question I wanted to ask. Um, if you had to choose one thing to keep, 
Would it be your hearing or your pitching? What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perfect. Can't quite, can't quite hear you. <laughs> That's funny. Huh? Uh, I am quick. <laughs> it's it's a fait complet, as they say in, in Quebecois. <laughs> You definitely give up your hearing. Yeah, I don't. I don't hear very well anyway. But, I never heard. You know, I never heard my managers. They never spoke English. I mean, they they spoke some. You know, Dick Williams was the only one I really ever listened to, and he was very arrogant and hard to hear. The other ones were just downright stupid. That's <laughs> Fanning. I'm talking about Jim Fanning. <laughs> Told you earlier I went through Iowa during the COVID and everything, and I was going on a back road going to northwest Iowa State, and uh, my driver, we came into a town. He had to say hello to a couple of people there that were actually Yankee fans and uh, introduced me to him, and we met him, and I go over. There's a ball field right on the main drag on the highway, and I go over. It's Jim Fanning Field. He's from Iowa. Is that funny or what? Hey, everything happens for a reason, and what goes around comes around, as they always say, right? That's exactly. That's, uh, yeah. Yogi Berra, you know, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. I have always taken the road least traveled that has made all the difference, Robert Frost. And you're in a hurry to get nowhere, Bill, all three of my wives. <laughs> Hey, but you've ended up in uh, many places, of course, even with the road less traveled. And I do want to come back to that 2012 outing against the San Rafael Pacifics. Again, nine inning, complete game. Not as long as the 11, 11 inning game that you had in the majors, but you, again, you just surrendered four runs in a 9-4 victory in those nine innings of work. But was it 94 pitches? I think I saw that you threw 94 pitches in that game. I sure did. In the last one, I jammed the guy, and he had a weak line drive up the middle, and my second baseman went out, leaped, and caught it, and I went down on my knees, and I prayed to the West. I don't pray to the East, but I sure do pray to the West. I mean, I guess if you pray to the West, it comes if far enough. It goes around to the East. But anyway, how does throwing 90-plus pitches in your 60s compared to when you threw 90-plus pitches per outing in the majors? No difference. If you keep, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I kept throwing my whole life. I only had a year and a half where I was off when I had shoulder surgery after uh, I had a terrible accident playing basketball and had to have my rotator cuff. And Larry Coughlin, you know, get a, did a great miracle surgery, completely repaired me. And it took me a year and a half. And a year and a half later, I was pitching as good as I ever pitched. So would you say that your, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it approach is what really kept your career going as long as it did? Yes. Yes, most definitely. I hurt my arm one other time. I had a competition with my grandson. We were skipping rocks on the Capel River. It's in northern Washington, and it drains out of Canada and the end of the Columbia River Basin. And I got up to 17 skips, and I totally dislocated my left shoulder. That took me about a year and three months to recover. I pitched through it, and I kept playing, and eventually it healed. And, uh, you know, right now I, I went out and threw yesterday, and I thought I was throwing as hard as I ever threw. But that's uh, I was throwing as hard as I ever threw. The ball just doesn't get there at the same velocity. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your velocity in those games that you played uh, with with uh, with Sonoma and with San Rafael and with Brockton? Yes, just like in my pro career, just hard enough. How hard does he throw? I go, <laughs> just hard enough. <laughs> yeah, you got to pitch in, you got to challenge people, you know, but just don't uh, make mistakes. You know, when you bite, bite inside. And I guess that's the biggest uh, similarity between golf and baseball is if you're going to miss, at least have a good miss and not a bad miss. Yes, 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 yes. You know, just uh, live on the corners. Live on the corners indeed. Um, but I also want to ask you now, so with that being said, with the fact that you're 
you d- if you don't use it, you lose it mentality. Did anything in terms of your approach change in the minors, like in your post major league career compared to your major league career with the way you attacked hitters, with the way you essentially mixed in your fastball with your with your uh, secondary off speed pitches? Did your approach change at all or not at all? Not at all. Find out what they can hit, then take it away from them. You know. And uh, I can read a hitter like a dime novel. You know, that's the one thing I can see. I can predict where every pitch is going to go, where it's going to, you know, I just have a great command of mathematics and, and, uh, and I would say uh, Euclidean uh, geometry. <laughs> um, now, I did also see the movie recently uh, the, when I, uh, when, once you, agreed to uh to doing this interview and by the way thank you so much for uh for joining uh langer at the mic here on my uh, that's my youtube and my spotify uh but i did see the movie about you spaceman in 2016 all about you standing up for rodney scott and the one question i want to ask you is do you what were your stats with the Sénatel de Longueuil? wow yeah i uh I love playing for Longay. You know, uh, Gino Lemity and the other guy, they came by my house and they said, "Would uh, what would it take? You know, you're going to pitch. Would you like to pitch for Longay? And, you know, I'd just been kicked out of Major League Baseball and uh, I probably was only off a week, you know. So I love the fact that I got to play uh, with the Longay uh, Senators and uh, – you know, it kept me going, and then I played for the Moncton Metropolitans, and then I played for the Sydney Sooners. I pitched in every province and won in every province and hit a home run in every province. And I don't think there's any Canadians that can say that. I definitely don't know of any Canadian that has pitched or hit a home run in all of the Canadian provinces. So definitely, uh, yeah, that is quite the one of many great accomplishments uh, of your that you've had over the course of your career, especially post-major leagues. But with that being said, though, looking back at your entire career, what are you most proud of? Wow, wow, wow. The, I would have to say, you know, the I'm most proud of the last game I won in the 70 and over national championships quad A. I went out and I beat the number one seed San Diego Padres, and then I beat the Washington Titans. I went four for five. I had a complete game and uh, played probably one of my greatest games at the age of 73. So, no, 72. Yeah, COVID year I didn't play. So it had to be 72. And I'm the defending 70 and over national championship in the United States. So right now I'm at the king of the hill and I probably won't play again. <laughs> well, against them probably. <laughs> but um, but one, one uh, or two more questions here. I want to ask also, uh, I, I read there's a whole epilogue about this in one of your books. Um, not, oh, it wasn't the Spaceman Chronicles. It was the one before, I believe, where you just had, I think, six pages on what your favorite part of the game of, of the game of baseball is. And if you can put that into, let's say, half a page, how would you describe your favorite part of the game of baseball? The fact that you never see the same thing twice. It is like uh, Bentley, uh, what was Snowflake Bentley from Jericho. No two snowflakes are alike. No two games are alike. Even a perfect game, everything is different. You can always go to a game and say, well, I never saw that before. The game is timeless. You can't use a clock. You can't divide it in half. It's all based on 333. You know, there's three outs. There's 27 bones in your left hand. There's 27 bones in your right hand. And there's 27 outs in a ball game. And is that uh, and would you say or, or what would you say is your secret? Because uh, I don't know if we uh, if I asked you this directly, you might have already answered it. But I want to ask you, what is your secret for playing this long of a, of a baseball career? For being involved in for for playing baseball for seventy four years professionally in the minors, coaching. What is what is your secret to have had this long of a career and a successful career in baseball? I know how to exhale properly. 
And you know what? I think that's great advice for not just baseball, but life. That's breathing. You're right. You know, you have to be able to exhale. You got to let it go. If you seek revenge, dig, dig two graves. Fair, yeah, fair enough. Um, but, uh, but yeah, honestly, Bill, thank you again so much for, for joining the show here, for joining my Langer the Mike YouTube channel and my podcast on Spotify. Um, and yeah. Well, thank you, and I'll get to see you guys. We'll all meet in Granby. There's a famous restaurant in Granby that has the best hot dogs and the best creamies in the world. And let's all meet in Granby. That's where I want to meet when the COVID lifts. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Okay, God willing, thank you. Sooner okay. than later. Stay in touch. Let me know when you're free and we'll meet. <laughs> Sounds good, Bill. Take care. Bye-bye. So there you have it. That was my interview with the Spaceman, former all-star left-handed pitcher Bill Lee of the Boston Red Sox and Montreal Expos. And if you enjoy the guests that I have here on Langer at the Mic, well, be sure to give me a big thumbs up on this video. Hit the subscribe button. Give me a follow at Mike Langer for Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And as usual, thank you so much for tuning in to this special edition of Langer at the Mic. And I look forward to seeing you next time.